Good day and welcome back to Chemistry Videos. Today we're going to talk about non-metals within ionic compounds. All right, so what does that look like? Ooh, I have yet another squeaky marker. Seems to be my lot in life. Metals in ionic compounds. In the previous video, should you have watched it, we talked about the fact that there are um, two different kinds of metals that we deal with in ionic compounds. And for the purposes of beginning chemistry, we tend to think of ionic compounds pretty exclusively as a metal plus a nonmetal, with the one exception of ammonium ions. Ammonium ion, uh, the ammonium ion is a polyatomic ion. It looks like, just as a side note, NH4 with a plus one charge. And that can, of course, because it's a polyatomic ion, form ionic compounds with other ions, with um, other nonmetals, and thus form the ionic compound kind of idea. But here, when we're talking about nonmetals and ionic compounds, for the vast majority of the time, we're talking about anions. Remember, anion is an ion with a minus charge. Okay, so we talked about. If you watched the last video, we talked about the fact that there are two different kinds of metals. There are also two different kinds of nonmetals. And what do those look like? Those, two, those basically look like major categories. We talk about them as monoatomic or polyatomic. I think these names are a little bit of a misnomer. And the reason why I think they're a little bit of a misnomer because, is because if you literally translated these names, mono in Greek means one, so you're talking about one atom, versus poly, many atoms, okay? The problem with that is that that's not exactly true. A lot of people, when they think of one atom, they think of literally one atom. And what this means more is that it's really atoms from one element. Right? Atoms that have formed a charge by exchanging electrons, either gaining or losing them. In this case, since it's anion, we're exclusively gaining electrons, okay, from another element and forming a charge, right? And thus those atoms become charged atoms, which are, is actually the definition of an ion, and they're from one element. Polyatomic really means atoms from multiple elements. How can you tell a monoatomic anion versus a polyatomic anion? Well, when you look after the metal, if there's just one capital letter, that's monoatomic. Because capital letters, every time you have a capital letter, that signifies a new element. Polyatomic would have multiple capital letters. Okay, So let's do um, a couple of big pieces here to look out for. Monoatomic anions are from the periodic table. And they end, if you were looking at the name, they end in IDE. Because they're from the periodic table and because all Nonmetals pretty much exist in the tall parts of the periodic table. They are all representative elements, so we know the charges for these. Okay. Or at least you should know the charges for these. Okay, whether you're doing periodic table origami or whether you're just memorizing them, you're looking in groups, basic, basically, you're looking in groups. 15, 16, 17. Those are the three groups. So 15 would be a minus 3 charge, 16 would be a minus 2 charge, and 17 would be a minus 1 charge. Okay? In terms of polyatomic ions, polyatomic ions are found on the polyatomic ion chart, which is fabulous that we have a chart that lists all these out. Too cool. And they tend to end in ITE or ATE, with two exceptions. Two ex the two exceptions are the tricks that you have to be aware of are cyanide, that ends in an ID, 
look through the entire periodic table for something that begins with cyan, you ain't going to find it. Cyanide is CN with minus 1. And hydroxide, again, you look through the entire periodic table for something that begins with hydrox. There's nothing there, which means that it's on the polyatomic ion chart. OK. All right, so let's do some examples of each of these. Let's do an example of monoatomic, since I have room right here. All right, an example. An example of a monoatomic anion. Let's do something kind of interesting. Maybe, eh, well, maybe I won't do something as interesting. Let's do, um, how about ALS, right? So Al2S3. There's an excellent example. OK. So when you're looking at this, notice that you know that it's an ionic compound, not just because I'm talking about ionic compounds in general, but it, you know it's an ionic compound because it starts with a metal, right? It has aluminum. Since it has aluminum, and aluminum is a representative element, which means it's in the tall parts of the periodic tables, groups 1 and 2 and 13 through 18, we know what those charges are. Therefore, we don't have to say what they are. We just have to put down the name. So if I were naming this, if I were given this formula, and I were naming it, I would just put aluminum as the first word. OK? The second word would come from the nonmetal. The nonmetal obviously has multiple atoms. It has multiple of these S's, but it's just one element, right? There's, no mul there's not multiple capital letters after the AL. So therefore, that is S. S is sulfur. When you do this, you're going to take off the ending and add an IDE. So sulfur becomes sulfide. And the name of that element, aluminum sulfide. Pretty cool. Fun stuff. Let's do that in direct contrast to something like um, something like that, right? Here, when you look at this, right, you know it's an ionic compound because it has a Cu. Cu is copper, copper is a metal. OK, when I deal with this one, I'm looking at the fact that copper is not in the tall parts of the periodic table. It's in the transition metals. Because it's in the transition metals, it has a variable charge. OK, because it has a variable charge. And variable is not quite right, right? What it really means is that copper can exist at many charges. That's what that really means. So because it can have multiple oxidation states or multiple charges, then what we're going to say here is we're going to call it copper. But I know I need to find some Roman numerals for that, right? So I need to figure out what its charge is. We'll talk about that in a minute in terms of being able to label what it is. And then you notice that you have multiple capital letters after that. And because you have multiple capital letters after that, that means that's a polyatomic ion. So you just look that sucker up on the polyatomic ion chart, realize that that is sulfate, and you write down sulfate. And that's it. Life is great. The hardest part of doing this is, of course, this piece of figuring out what the charge on the copper is. So when you look up sulfate, let me just erase this for a moment. I'll erase my ammonium over here. When you look up sulfate on the polyatomic ion chart, you should maybe also think about what its charge is, right? So here's CuSO4. I know that all of this goes together, and that has an overall minus 2 charge. Because that has a minus 2 charge, I also say that that's, I don't know what the copper is. So I'm going to call that x. You can solve this in several ways, right? You can say, if this has an overall minus 2 charge, then copper has to have a plus 2 in order to balance that. Or you can multiply straight down. And if you multiply straight down, what you're doing is you're taking the charge times the number of atoms. That would be x times 1, because there's nothing written there. So there's at least one of them. And minus 2 times 1. If you add those together, this has to have a neutral charge overall, which means that it has to, the sum of the charges has to equal zero. That's 
in essence saying the same thing as you would for a neutral compound. So in this case, x times 1 is x, minus 2 mi times 1 is minus 2, equals 0, x minus 2 equals 0, so x has to equal plus 2, and you're going to write that in Roman numerals right there. It's a long process. We're going to practice this a lot more. Until we see you again, I bid you adieu.